The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that buzz the next. Big jab there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock him, sock him, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, this going to be a good one today. Celebration Monday on the Anakin Florian podcast. The New York Yankees, of course, is the reason. We'll celebrate for some other reasons, but the New York Yankees have been eliminated <laughs> from postseason contention. Zero World Series championships last decade and uh, none so far this decade as well. Great to be back with you guys. Monday, October 24, 2022, episode 370 of the Anakin Florian podcast. I came back to Miami, landed about 11 hours ago from Abu Dhabi. But I got nothing on Ken Flo, who hasn't seen his children. I mean, when you go home, your son is not going to want anything to do with you. He's not going to recognize you. Um, How's it going out there, man? I know it's been a long trip, but how's everything going with filming, BattleBots, everything else? Yeah, it's going great, man. I'm having a blast. uh, My my voice is is holding on for dear life, Uh, uh, basically working like 13-hour days. But uh, it's been fun, man. Actually, uh, UFC legend Chuck Liddell was in the BattleBots uh, arena yesterday. So that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, but uh, no, been been busy, man. Can't wait to go home though. Uh, you know, miss my kids. But uh, man, it was it was a great uh, night of fights the other night. Yeah, we got a lot to get to, and a nice little Ultimate Fighter season one reunion at the BattleBots Arena over the weekend. But what a wild week at UFC 280. I have to thank the UFC fans around the world, not just for all of the support when we had boots on the ground in Abu Dhabi, uh, but just for the response to this live event. Like there were so many Americans, Ken Flo, on our flight from JFK to Abu Dhabi going to Yaz Island oh. just to watch UFC 280. Sold a ton of tickets in the UK and uh, just a festive, festive weekend weekend. So we're going to rip into the recap. Um, you'll have some bonus content later in the week. Ray Longo is on an airplane right now. So we will push out a special Ray Longo minute later in the week. We will also talk to co-host of Remember the Show, Bilal Muhammad, of course, here, part of the channel. Big win for him. We'll get into all of his win today, but we will talk to him later in the week as well. And remember the show uh, coming up on Thursday, but a lot to get to today. And of course, on the back end picks for UFC fight night, Cater versus Allen. But we will begin with the main event, UFC 280. For me, as compelling a matchup as I thought the promotion could put together, I think retrospectively, maybe I didn't realize just how good Islam Akashev was in terms of the betting line, at least. But it's Islam Makashev over Charles Oliveira by arm triangle at 316 of round two. Bilal Muhammad's high school wrestling coach and chief corner now, Lewis Taylor, was in the back with Islam Kenny, and he just couldn't stop marveling at just how confident and cool. It's almost just so matter of fact, Islam texting people back before the fight. He knows how good he is, and I think that even though he's just getting going, he's one of the greatest lightweights I've ever seen and uh, a big submission win over Charles Oliveira, the submission king to begin his lightweight reign. Yeah, I'll say, you know, this is a guy who's been wrestling, uh, fighting a very long time. Um, You know, his record, uh, the way that he's been brought up in the game, the people that he surrounds himself with, uh, the skills that he's accrued over time, is what's giving him that confidence um, and, and that calmness. I think there was a certain point where he hit, um, he hit that point where he started believing in his skills. And he started believing in what all the other people around him believed was that he was the best 155 pounder in the world. You could see that now in the way he comes out, um, even in the stare down and his confidence. A lot, you know, I don't like to put a lot into that. You can tell that this was a guy that really wasn't so nervous. He was confident in his abilities, as was Charles Oliveira. Um, but, uh, you know, the skills just didn't match with what Islam had uh, that night. And um, I-, I was very impressed with his performance, for sure. So, obviously, we'll get into some of the fight itself, of course, with uh, with the MMA mind that is Kenny Florian. But, you know, sometimes when fighters lose fights, I talk about these two-year setbacks. And sometimes you sort of, you know, internally roll your eyes. I know you never look at me and actually roll your eyes back at me. But when Islam Kashev lost to Adriano Martins in his second UFC fight, 
the expectations were pretty lofty then. And he was one and one in the UFC. And it was like, oh man, he's going to have to rebuild right now. He just got knocked out by Adriano Martins. And I think not unlike a loss will be good for Sean Brady. I think certainly it was good for Islam at that point in time. But we have been told for years, Kenny, that this was the star pupil of Abdulmanap Nurmagomedov, his favorite student, the guy for whom he would put chips in the center of the table every day of the week. The guy that was better than Khabib Nurmagomedov, whose game was maybe even more nuanced, better striker. We've heard it all for years. Would be favored against any lightweight in the world. And then he showed he was, wasn't a big enough favorite against a guy who had run roughshod through all of the credential lightweights of this era, essentially over the last two years. I mean, just insane. Yeah. Again, you know, it, it was able to come together at the right time. Anytime you are, uh, dealing with volatility in your life, in your career, um, you have to stay the course uh, to understand that it, that's going to later uh, give you that long-term durability. And, and and that's what that was about. When you're losing, you're finding out that weakness. Uh, you're finding out whether it's mental, physical, technical, all those things. And it's a thing that you want to experience earlier in your career than later in your yeah. career, like let's say a Charles Oliveira, right? So um, the fact that it came together the way that it did is a great reminder for those that are getting into the game, for those that are watching as fans, that just because someone loses, it doesn't mean that you won't see them later on with the strap. Um, and to see Islam, to see how far he's come uh, and you know where he's at at this point in his career, it's it's awesome to see. What were your thoughts on the fight itself? Okay, so the fight itself, you know, it, for me, this is a great reminder of the importance of def defensive capabilities. If you look at, you know, it's easy for us to go back, but we've talked about this. When you look at Charles Oliveira's wins, they weren't always clean wins where he got out without a mark. Like there were times where he'd get knocked out. It looked like he was going to get knocked out. Then he came back to get the submission. Um, it seems like Charles Oliveira, if he's not beating you up, he's getting beat up. Uh, and, and that is a difficult thing to deal with, especially when you have so many talented 155 pounders. That's especially an issue with a guy in Islam Mahashev who barely makes any mistakes. You cannot be on the cusp of chaos. You cannot be on the cusp of getting finished. And it's it's one thing to be dangerous, and it's another thing to be powerful. Islam is powerful. Charles Oliveira is dangerous. Um, and, and I talk about this a lot, but like, um, you know, you can have all the offensive capabilities in the world, but if you are easy to kill, then – I don't know. It, it doesn't mean you're not dangerous, but it just means that at some point you're going to not only lose, but get finished. And that's what it seems like. That's what happens in Charles Oliveira's fights. And, and it doesn't mean he's not a great fighter. Uh, he's still extremely dangerous, but Islam Mahashev was not going to make a mistake that night. Charles Oliveira was going to have to force him into something crazy. Um, and Islam was just not having it. Um, furthermore, I think Islam's striking seemed to be more of a threat than, say, a lot of other grapplers in that division, including Habib Nurmagomedov. So he was keeping him honest with his striking, and you saw Charles Oliveira reach, open up space between his armpit and hip, uh, and, and that was the arm triangle uh, that was uh, basically presented to Islam. So it was Islam taking advantage of a major mistake from Charles Oliveira, and, um, you know, it, I, I was just – Really impressed with uh, Mahashev, his consistency, uh, and his pressure. So DC said right before the fight that he just loves calling Charles Oliveira fights. And how could you not, right? Always, to your words, beautifully put on the cusp of chaos, right? But yeah, I mean, he does play with fire to be sure. And when you look at some of the other guys who have had a chance against him, you wonder now when they look at sort of him lose now this version, like, man, if I could have been just a little bit more fundamentally minded or disciplined to try to extend the fight just a little bit, maybe there would have been a different outcome. Now, I think also for a lot of those guys, the Michael Chandlers and Dustin Poirier's of the world, they're probably like, man. Islam Akashi is a lot harder guy for me to beat now, potentially, when I do get back to the precipice. Michael Bisping said before the fight, Kenny, if Charles Oliveira beats Islam Akashev, he's the greatest lightweight of all time. And it's like, yeah, he is, right? Because like, I, I was like, yeah, man, because if he adds this guy, right, the, the modern day Habib, like Habib 2.0, essentially, and that probably denigrates Habib too much to, to suggest that, right? But 
to beat Makhachev, right? And maybe also, too, Daniel Cormier is my broadcast partner. So, again, I've just been hearing about this guy. It seems like that he was just the anointed, the heir apparent. It was just happening, you know? Mm-hmm. If he could have beat that guy, yeah, I mean, Charles was going to be of that ilk. But I I, I think it's going to be really interesting now to watch Charles Oliveira rebuild against somebody like Benil Daryush or Conor McGregor or anybody else. Um, As you spin it fo- forward for Islam Akashev, uh, you know, he is fighting a featherweight in his first title defense. DraftKings Sportsbook has opened the betting line minus 305 uh, for Islam Makhachev. Now, Volkanovsky, it seems like just when he has like mastered the the cut to featherweight, now he's going to, you know, blow up and try to become a two division champion. And, um, you know, I'm glad at least that he'll have a training camp for one of these guys and not, you know, a few weeks for both of them in a backup situation. Um, but what are your thoughts? Big picture on Makhachev moving forward. How long can he sort of maintain hold of this division and your thoughts on the matchup that seemingly they're going to make in Perth in February for title defense number one? Islam's exactly what you want. If you're a coach uh, and you're in the 155-pound division, it's exactly what you want. First of all, um, as far as wrestling uh, pedigree uh, and wrestling skills, you want that. Why? Because you have the ability to pick and choose where you want the fight to happen. Um, Islam has that. Um, and he's probably the highest level um, mixed martial arts wrestler in that division. The other thing you want is consistency. Um, is he consistent? Yes. Um, the other thing that you want, does he make mistakes? No, not really. So he's, he's a guy that's going to force you to beat him. So I, I think he has the potential to hold on to that belt for a very, very long time. Um Volkanovsky is r- right now fighting um, in its prime. He is probably the most well-rounded mixed martial artist right now, as far as you know, performing at a high level of skill in all facets. Um, he he's that dude. The problem is he's going against a massive lightweight in Islam Mahashev. That I think it that's ultimately going to be the difference. I think is. Having to, when you're colliding against that heavier object repeatedly and you have to carry that weight repeatedly, that will wear on you. Volkanovsky can deal with that 145 pounds. He's not the biggest 145 pounder. People need to remember that. Now he's going to try to do that against a, a big 155 pounder who will most likely grind on him, lay on him, clinch with him. Take him down. So he's got to deal with that. Volkanovsky is clearly the better striker. Um, I think, you know, defensively, submission-wise, I think he'll be okay. Um, But I think he's going to get into some spots on the ground where he's going to have to carry the weight, deal with ground and pound, and find a way to get back to his feet. So I think that, you know, Islam would win that um, perhaps by decision. But I I can't wait to see that fight. Volkanovski has been so damn impressive. um, And it's always fascinating anytime you get a guy who's going up in weight uh, in search of two world championship belts. I just don't always love when the handicap begins with size. You know, if Robert Whitaker and Israel Adesanya meet for a third time, when we handicap that fight, it always begins with the size, the length. And, you know, every time I talk to Whitaker about that that fight, it's sort of like, you know, I've closed the gap a little bit, but how do I navigate the size? And I think at least this point, you know, 48 hours removed from this result, every time I ask anybody about Makashev and Volkanovsky, a big part of the handicap um, is that size discrepancy. But hey, Volkanovsky right now essentially is the pound for pound king and he's getting a shot and, and it's certainly going to be a huge fight and in all likelihood the main event in Perth. So very exciting things there. And Charles Oliveira wouldn't have been a three to one favorite over Volkanovsky. I think that maybe on paper at least would have been a little bit more competitive from a betting perspective, not to suggest that Volkanovsky can't spring the upset here. Um, but Congrats to Islam Akashev and uh, just really a special thing. I don't know that I've ever seen Khabib Nurmagomedov so happy. He certainly wasn't that happy after his wins. You know, I can tell you that a lot of these guys really enjoy coaching and um, very happy for that entire team. They spent over a million dollars. Did you hear us say that on the on the broadcast, Ken Flo? Over a million dollars on the training camp, over a mil on the training camp. I mean, they were catering meals for a 30 pack, you know, most of the time and Bilal experienced a lot of that. And um, so, yeah, congratulations to Islam wow. Akashev, really classy guy, new father. Um, as I tweeted, just perfect mix of like confidence and humility and uh, 
one of those resting heart rate guys, I can assure you when he's walking out, his resting heart rate is is another day at the office type stuff. Um, but we'll see how it goes for him in Perth. That's going to be interesting with a, you know, a lot of uh, loud Aussies poking at him. All right. Co-headliner, Aljamain Sterling over TJ Dillashaw by TKO at 344 of round two. I was looking at the clock in round one when it said 306, thinking, how is TJ Dillashaw going to navigate these three minutes? If you don't know, TJ Dillashaw, six or seven months ago, I believe, maybe it wasn't that long ago, dislocated a shoulder and it kept popping out in training. And I saw TJ at a bar after the fight with his family. And he basically said it was going to be a major surgery uh and it's a surgery that he's now going to have and it was going to put him out for another year so the thought process was to try to train through it and you know certainly there's a lot of venom being directed at tj a lot of darts being thrown his way and certainly there's going to be some probably that are fired his way today um but this is one tough kid man and you know he made the decision certainly it's a financially based decision in some part but he made the decision to work through this injury put himself in shape to try to win this fight. He didn't necessarily know how the shoulder would or would not respond in the first grappling sequence of the fight. Um, I don't want to take anything away from Aljamain Sterling, and I don't want to be long-winded either. Your thoughts on just a crazy, crazy situation uh, in the UFC Bantamweight Championship fight? It is a crazy situation. You know, um, perhaps TJ uh, needed needed a paycheck, needed money. Uh, I, I guess maybe that was it. Or also, sometimes as fighters... Uh, we push ourselves to certain limits that are just simply unattainable. Um, you know, this is a, a, a small example of me. I remember going to Abu Dhabi myself uh, for a jiu-jitsu match against Shaolin uh, after getting the norovirus the night before. And I probably ate uh, a spoonful of rice and uh, a piece of meat in three days, you know, uh, leading to that. Oh. That was a jiu-jitsu match. That was – that was just stupidity of me going, well, I could do it. I feel good. I'm mentally, I'll be able to push through this, blah, blah. This is a dude who had a dislocated shoulder. He was going to participate in a world championship mixed martial arts fight against one of the best grapplers in the division and Aljamain Sterling. Um, that was probably a lot to ask of yourself, right? Um, so I, I don't know if that was the smartest thing. But again, sometimes as fighters, we believe a little bit too much. Um, and there's a fine line between toughness and stupidity, if I'm being honest. And yeah. um, as fighters, we've we've done that. Now, we all make decisions in our life, some of them selfless, some of them selfish, right? You pull out of the fight, potentially you never get another championship opportunity. Maybe it does come around again. But he had all, obviously gone through a major surgery after the Sandhagen fight. Now, he's never going to get it, get the benefit of the doubt in the court of public opinion. That much is obvious. And certainly there are a lot of people who are going to suggest that performance enhancing drugs, especially, you know, doing it seemingly on the level that he did it, uh, is not going to help your body moving forward in terms of its ability to sustain as opposed to break down, right? I mean, there's a lot of different layers to this. I mean, how about Mark Goddard, right? It's disclosed to him in the back by TJ that this thing's going to pop out. It does repeatedly, and Goddard has to navigate that. I mean, my thesis statement is that he probably shouldn't have been fighting, but, you know, I don't know how you make that decision, you know, if TJ is disclosing that injury, you know, half an hour before the fight. I mean, here's the, th here's the problem with that, John. Are you telling me TJ Dillashaw, one of the best bantamweights of all time, was going to get denied a shot later on down the line? If he waited, would they have told TJ, hey, man, you know, I don't know if you're a big enough name for this division. We're going we're, we're gonna to put you on the sidelines for a little bit. No. Like, he had one fight against Corey Sanhagen and got the fight. you telling me they would have told uh, TJ to take a back seat and to chill a little bit? Hey, we got a bunch of other guys ahead of you. He's the biggest name in yeah, that division. No. No, I think that's fair. I think that's a good point. And certainly you know? internally in terms of the metrics, he must be moving some needles because you're right. He was the yeah. first name that Aljo uttered right after his first defense against Piotr Jan. And promotionally, I think you're right that it probably would have come around again. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, he apologized to, to the division. That was the first thing out of his mouth. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to it. And right. I think the biggest Negative out of all of it is I don't know what the clock has said, but we just spent four or five minutes and haven't said anything about the chant. Right. You know? Right. Well, I mean, that's a big story. That's a big story. Unfortunately, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't look good, right, optics-wise, but that's a huge story. That is a real thing that happened. However, T 
TJ Dillashaw would have had a hell of a time. Yeah. A hundred percent healthy against someone like Aljo, right? And the other thing you got to talk about, you know, some of the techniques that he was throwing, you know, he was throwing kicks that, you know, if you're going against a really high level grappler like Aljo Main Sterling, it's just, it was a poor choice. You know, those are the kind of things that Aljo is going to take advantage of. Um, so he would have had a difficult time regardless. Like, you know, TJ Dillashaw is not known for his guard game. And uh, Aljo, when he gets on top of you, was going to take advantage of that. Um, and, you know, also just shows the, the high level that Aljo is at as well. Like, there's other guys that still wouldn't have been able to take down TJ, you know, oh, yeah. shoulder yeah. or not. And Aljo, once he got positioned, you know, he was not getting out of there. And um, it was an amazing uh, display of heart and toughness by TJ Dillashaw. But uh, Aljamain Sterling is way too skilled, way too good, and way too on point for you to go on with a, a bad hair day. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, Aljo's yeah. that good. So I, I, it's it's important to mention. You're absolutely right. We don't want to take away from from Aljo. It's a real thing that happened at TJ Dillashaw. Uh, but you know, a- Aljo is is really good, and you could see oh. that confidence wise, dude. After that last fight against Jan, it did something. It absolutely did something. Aljamain Sterling is going to be very difficult to beat, man. And TJ Dillashaw, by the way, did say he's going to have this surgery, and he said to me, "quote." I'm definitely not retiring. So uh, that's the Dillashaw stuff. But in terms of Aljamain Sterling, right, it's eight consecutive wins. And this is a scalp that uh, is a big one in terms of his Bantamweight legacy, in terms of his quest to be the greatest Bantamweight of all time, which I know means something to Aljamain Sterling. Not a great night for May Rob Dwalish Willie, except because he's a great teammate, right? But for, for May Rob, it's like RJ Clifford, our colleague, my colleague, you know, your good friend. You know, was asked on the UFC 280 weigh-in show, like, who's the best bandmate in the world? And he says, may Rob Dwalish Willie, right? And, and may Rob just has to be an afterthought in the middle of his fighting prime. But eventually, I think he'll get his opportunity. Just got to keep winning. But for Aljo, bro, like, just an incredibly, you know, big, physical, marauding bantamweight who's going to have a grappling advantage overwhelmingly over a lot of guys in this division. You know, even when you hear Aljamain Sterling in a confident way talk about the Henry Cejudo matchup, right? danger factor high and if it's not necessarily a submission danger factor all the time losing 10-8 rounds you know this was a 10-8 round for sure another one you know this guy leads the bantamweight division in 10-8 rounds so Aljo's a real problem Ken Flo and when I hear him say there are levels to this MMA grappling game you know no one can speak to that better than you you know Uh, again just positionally um he's going to be superior to a lot of guys out there um, he's, he's really big for the weight class. He knows how to integrate wrestling for mixed martial arts as well. And he's funky enough with his striking, uh, that he's just awkward to go against. He's awkward to get a handle on, you know, the way that he moves. Uh, and then once he gets a hold of you, you realize, dude, this guy probably feels like 145 pounders. So yeah. he, he's, he's got a lot of advantages going for him right now. It's great to see he's dealt with a lot of crap. Uh, over the course of his career, a lot of criticism. This, you could argue, is going to be another one of those things where people start doubting him. Um, it's not his fault TJ got hurt. He yeah. went out there and did exactly what he's supposed to do, which is, you know, kick ass. So, And as you know, I mean, Dominic Cruz is as dear a friend as I have in the fight game, but I don't know how you don't argue Aljamain Sterling's case as an all-time great bantamweight. He's won eight in a world, eight in a row. He's done it all in the UFC, Right. And even when he talked about Henry Cejudo's title defense against Dominic Cruz, you know, COVID, I love Henry too, Kenny, but it's like COVID-19 backdrop, you know, Cruzy not able to train nor spar, trying to take advantage of an opportunity. You know, Aljamain Sterling is fighting killer after killer, all in their primes, all with full training camps, you know? I mean, I don't know what else you say, folks. Like, again, I I didn't love the post-fight interview. You know, like I love the real Aljo, the Aljo we see in our fighter meeting, the Aljamain Sterling at the post-fight press conference talking about his Bantamweight legacy. I don't like the goofy post-fight interview, you know, and Cody in our pre-show meeting was suggesting like, dude, get on a mic and call out Volkanovsky at 45, you know? I like the Cejudo call out too. I think that's a big fight, you know, but sometimes I think Aljamain Sterling um, in his excitement and in his celebratory mode, you know, does himself a disservice with the post-fight interview um, after these great wins, you know? Yeah, I, I don't like I don't like the call out at 145 pounds, to be honest. You know, he, this is like, what, his second defense? 
Yeah, you which know, is a lot from, at 35. But yeah, well, how many? There's a lot of people at 135 pounds. Like, focus on 135 pounds. I don't yeah. like when people start talking about different weight classes. He's got a lot of challenges still at 135 pounds. You got Cheeto. You got Sugar. You got, uh, you know, San Hayden coming back. You got all these other yeah. guys that are looking for shots. Focus on 135. Clear out the division legitimately. Then start talking about 145 if that's a serious thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, again, the way he matches up against the other guys that are coming up, I really like those matches for Aljo. You know, it's going to be really tough for, for someone to come up, Sugar or whoever. Um, I, I'd say take some time, work on those grappling skills if you're going to yeah. face Aljo and Sterling. <laughs> One name that he did not say was Sugar Sean O'Malley, who we will get to here in a moment. But you're right, there are a lot of contenders, you know, but the cupboard's not bare at featherweight either, right? Like Volkanovsky obviously has been there and done that as a featherweight champion, and that's why you probably think he deserves the opportunity, yeah. you know? But Arnold yeah. Allen's fucking 9-0 and in the UFC, and if he beats Calvin Cater this weekend, he's 10-0 and in the UFC, right? So, yeah, maybe he'll get an interim opportunity, but look what happened to Tony Ferguson with the interim championship opportunities. Two of those, double-digit sure. lightweight winning streak, never fought for the undisputed title, you know? Um, mm. Largely, I don't like anybody jumping divisions, really. I don't really love the Volkanovski thing. I mean, Yair Rodriguez yeah. and Josh Emmett are right there, not to mention Arnold Allen, you know? So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, I mean, and don't sit here and tell me Emmett and Yair aren't worthy, you know, but we congratulate Aljamain Sterling. We'll talk to him, obviously, in depth later on. I felt shortchanged by the fight, though, if I'm being honest. You know, one thing that I would say is that TJ Dillashaw is less submittable than I thought, to be sure. I know TJ's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, but I don't think he was getting submitted in that fight over 25 minutes. Maybe he gets knocked out. I just liked what I saw from a one arm Dillashaw defensively early. Just he very mentally in it as a grappler, heart of a warrior. I know people don't want to come here for Dillashaw praise today, but I don't think he was getting submitted by Aljamain Sterling. I just feel shortchanged by the fight, you know, like that's all. I, I agree with you. I'm right there with you. And, and that's going to be the criticism. That's where that's where people's frustrations are really coming from, John, if, if you're being honest. So I think I think you nailed it there. But I can't even believe that he was able to get back to his feet with one oh. fucking arm. With one arm, he got out of a body triangle from Aljamain Sterling yeah. and got back to his feet like that alone yeah. should be just like, dude, right. Yeah. Well yeah. fucking done. Yeah. <laughs> you're and a fucking man just to he, do that. Yeah, there's no you're right. And I <laughs> I I do think for Aljo it is interesting, and I sort of alluded to it on the broadcast, right? But the only fighter in UFC history to gain the throne, the undisputed title via DQ, and then one of his first two title defenses. He has this circumstance and gives people, you know, an opportunity or a platform on which to criticize. But you're right. You know, you add some of these other guys and Henry Cejudo, Marlon Chito Vera, the most decorated bantamweight finisher of all time. You add a title defense or two like those guys. You start to distance yourself, even from someone like Dominic Cruz, whose career took place largely in the WEC. I mean, go look. I don't know that any bantamweight has ever defended the title three times, you know? So congratulations to Aljamain Sterling. Big things. And the number one contender is going to be Sugar Sean O'Malley. I feel pretty confident when the UFC rankings come out. He gets by Piotr Jan by split decision 29, 28 times two. The dissenting judge had it flipped. Lot to get to here, Ken Flo. Your thoughts on Sugar Sean O'Malley proving at the very least what myself humbly and many others have been saying for years that he's elite and belongs among the elite. And uh, even if you don't think he won the fight, certainly can't deny him that, Ken Flo. Your thoughts on the fight of the night? John, I would say that would be the number one takeaway for him is that he belongs. The number two takeaway for him, and this is something he needed, was that um, perhaps he's been viewed as a front runner that when things are going well for him, uh, he's great. But when things start to go bad for him, that he doesn't have the heart or he does, you know, he doesn't have the durability or blah, blah. He put that to rest as well, which I think was a, a huge point. He had to deal with some serious adversity against an absolute savage in Piotr Young, right? A guy who has been, um, a marauding force in that division, a former champion. Looks like we might have lost Ken Flo for a minute there, folks. As soon as I started to type in the chat room that I was going to call for Brian Petrie when we transitioned to Benil Daryush, you cut out. Oh, he's back. Yeah. Can you hear as me you now? were As you were saying, yes. Damn. Um, so anyways, I don't even know where the hell I was, but uh, where I got cut, cut off. But anyway, so th this was an important point, right, for him to show that he's not a front runner, that he can come back that he can deal with adversity. 
Um, and I thought it was a close fight. Um, people calling it a robbery. What are you watching? What are you watching? I'm sorry. That's not a robbery. That's not a robbery. I, I, I had it first round for uh, O'Malley. I thought the third round was O'Malley's. I thought the second round was Piotr Jans. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a fucking classic. These guys are so good everywhere. Um, I, I think that for Sugar, I'd like to see him improve even more some of those skills as far as getting back to his feet, being more of a submission threat, improving his wrestling. If he wants to face someone like Aljamain Sterling, I would be a little nervous for him. But uh, O'Malley's a fucking problem, man. And he's been building his career in the right way. That's yeah. one thing I think about his career. He's been taking the right fights. He's been improving. Um, he's so tall for that division. He's fast as shit. Uh, he's a sniper. He's going to be really tough to beat on the feet. And beating a guy like Jan should be a huge confidence and momentum builder for him and his team. All of his training camps with Tanquino Mendez and others are grappling heavy. Even a training camp for Piotr Jan. He's a willing grappler. He's an able grappler. I just don't love the Aljamain Sterling matchup from a grappling yeah. perspective, at least in terms of some of the physicality and the way Sterling would be trying to take that fight. But I wouldn't at all be surprised to see Sugar Sean O'Malley's next fight be for the championship. Maybe it'll be a rematch with Cheeto Vera, but I want to focus on this fight itself. Um, you know, close fights can still be 30 27, right? I think one of right. our producers had it 30 to 27 for Piotr Jan. Now, I thought the clearest round might have been round two for Jan, right? But I, I want to read something from uh, Boxing Bush, host of the Heavy Hands podcast. I guess I can't be surprised. Since Piotr Jan is a hardcore fan favorite and O'Malley is a casual fan favorite slash general menace. But if you look at that fight and conclude that the correct result is blindingly obvious, I don't know what to tell you. There are robberies and then there are close fight. That was a close fight, like close fight. And when you right. look at the third round, Sean O'Malley had an overwhelming striking advantage and Piotr Jan Absolutely. had a couple of minutes of control time with the grappling. Didn't do a ton with it, right? No. Oftentimes, beauty can be in the eye of the beholder. Now, I can assure you that if we were under the guise of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, there are a couple of those judges based upon all that damage doled out by Sean O'Malley early round three. They are definitely giving Sean O'Malley a 10-9 in round three in 2022. Definitely. So. 100%. 100%. And, and again, I, I don't like um, criticizing. I hope you know the, the my fellow colleagues uh, take this as a, um, you know, constructive criticism when you see first of all when you're seeing o'malley dole out way more damage on the feet and you hear you know paul say that oh you know a takedown here by yawn could win him this round no that's not the way you score a fight that's not that's not going to be the thing like i can't tell you how many people reached out to me and were like oh dude did you see that o'malley fight that was a robbery and then I explained to them how a fight is scored. They're like, oh, I, I didn't know that. Oh, really? Well, they were talking about a take. No, a takedown isn't going to give you the round. Stop. This isn't right. 1998, guys. Like, please, get Here's how you the rules. Yeah. yeah. Here's how you steal a round, quote unquote, with a takedown, okay? If the striking is absolutely identical with 30 seconds to go and the judge cannot determine a winner based upon what is an effective striking round largely, then there's a late takedown. And if the judge deems that to be effective, then he goes to effective grappling, right? But essentially... The third round, I think, for a lot of people who are interpreting the criteria, right? Like Luke Thomas and others have suggested the issue is with the criteria. I have said, yeah, there's a general lack of appreciation for the grappling. But right. that was an effective striking round to me. And that's why for me, there's probably a lean O'Malley. I mean, I got a lot of shit going on. I guess for me, that's kind of an easy way to couch it. But when I was first asked about the fight, I think I said maybe 29, 28 Jan. Um, but then the truck said to me, like, do you want to know who wins? And. I said, yes, I do. And they said, it's Sugar Shot O'Malley. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. That, yeah. that, but again, you like the matchup for him. I think if I'm not mistaken, you picked him in the fight. And um, I just feel like for a long time, people just got caught up in the persona. And at least for a lot of the avid fans, maybe 
despite their keen eye, they don't understand that this guy is not only being built the right way to your point, but putting in the right work has all the skills. You know, I, I guess the, the tough thing is that he can't add too much muscle to prepare for Aljo because he's already fucking enormous at 135 pounds. You know, he's huge. Right. He's like six feet tall. No, I, he, he really is. It's crazy. Having to get inside that range is going to be a problem even for, you know, guys like Aljo. My concern is once Aljo gets into that clinch position, his strength and his control is going to be tough for Sugar to deal with. So I, I, this this was a great result for Sugar, but I would say take a little bit more time before someone like yeah. Sterling, in my opinion. And, and again, I'm someone who thinks very highly of O'Malley. I just think that's going to be a really tough out for him. Uh, so maybe taking a little bit more time, may, maybe taking that Cheeto Vera rematch perhaps. Uh, or, you know, maybe Cheeto gets that next shot. You know, uh, Cheeto certainly yeah. deserves it. So I don't know. And I will say this for me and Kenny both, like Piotr Jan's the fucking man, you know, easily could have won what was a very close fight, will certainly be yep. back. And Piotr Jan is the type of guy for me at 135 pounds right now. He's one win away from, from a title fight, basically at all times, right? Until further notice. On paper, Kenny, Jan has lost three of four. But don't tell me his next fight is not going to be of the enormous variety and be a title eliminator of sorts, right? Dude, he delivers so much action. He's he's the kind of fighter the UFC must salivate over because of the way that he fights in a division that is absolutely stacked. I love his mentality. Uh, you know, he was fighting every second of that fight. He ate some big shots that not a whole lot of 135 pounders would be able to take. Okay. Yeah. That dude's got a chin from hell, kept walking forward. Um, and and again, it was such a close fight that if he wanted, I would have been like, okay, that right, makes sense. Right, that, right. Not, not not out of the uh, out of the question either. But again, that would not be a robbery either way. Stop. Yeah. All right. So quickly as we spin it forward for Sugar Sean O'Malley, just because he might have the number one next to his name, that doesn't necessarily mean that his next fight is going to be for the title. I do think they'll try to do Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo. And wouldn't it be nice to see a co-headliner with Sean O'Malley and Marlon Cheeto Vera? I'd rather see those guys actually in a three-round co-main event than in a five-round main event setting. Um, but don't you kind of want to see some finality and closure with Cheeto and O'Malley in a title eliminator and then have uh, Cejudo and, and Sterling settle their business? What do you think about that as a, as a course of action? John, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I would love to see that. I think it makes sense for both guys in a lot of ways. I think they're very similar. Two tall, lanky strikers um, who, uh, you know, have a claim to, to that next yeah. shot. Um, and I think it would it would be in both of their benefits to take a little bit more time before going against someone like Aljamain Sterling. And opinion. I do a Corey Sanhagen, May Rob Dwalish Willie main event, something like that. And uh, and off you go. Love it. You know, May Rob's going to find himself in a big fight. But uh, yeah, I don't think Aljo's moving up to 45 anytime soon, although weight cuts are not getting any easier as he hits those uh, mid 30s. Um, all right. I want to bring into the conversation host of the MMA Takes podcast, Anakin Florian podcast, handicapper, Brian Big Gun Petrie. Actually, we go Big Gun Brian Petrie. Excuse me. We go That's Nick right. From big the Gun name. first. You can tell. He's like, what's this guy doing? Put the fucking nickname in the middle. Uh, good to have you with us. I want yes. to bring you into the UFC 280 recap. I know you've been waiting patiently. Some technical difficulties there off the top. Um, what do you think about Sean O'Malley real quickly in the 135-pound division? Ooh, Kenny and I both got him. I love the edge Kenny has right now. This is one of Kenny's my favorite Kenny shows. The internet's really pissing him off. He's ha. got a little bit of edge, and he's got these takes that I love. Listen, I had a lot of money on Sean O'Malley. I had, a, I had a five to one ticket on the win by decision. So when those cards were announcing, my buddies are like, dude, 30, 27 yawn. I'm like, there's no way it's 30, 27 yawn. No way it's a robbery in my opinion. It was a close fight for sure. I can see people scoring a 29, 28 yawn. But the people that scored a 30, 27 yawn are just the people dismissing Sean O'Malley from the beginning. They thought he shouldn't have done as well as he did. I mean, if he he would have won maybe all three rounds if he didn't get caught in that second round because he hurt Jan in the second round. He did. He got right. Then he got dropped. And I love what he showed in the third because he got dropped in the second. First time in the UFC he's been dropped. And then the third, he took some big shots and walked through them and said, fuck it, I'm letting, I'm letting my stuff go. So I cast a pretty penny on Sean O'Malley. I, I lose a lot of close decisions, so I needed that one. Um, and I've gotten so many DMs like, okay, cool, you won some money. How'd you score it? I said, I scored it for my bank account, buddy. That's how I scored <laughs> That's right. it. You don't right. need to know. Right. Scored it for my bank account. It cast, checks cleared. We're good. I know you both <laughs> were very dismissive of the 30 to 27 yawn, right? Yeah. But 
it seemed like the majority of people out there gave him round two for sure. And rounds yeah. one and three, like were close to people. So that that's mm-hmm. all I'm saying is just that like, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that you could land 30, 27. I guess for me, like if I was sitting on a card that was 20 to 18 Jan and mm-hmm. I watched that third round play out, I'd probably find that round for Sean O'Malley mm-hmm. because I know my card's still 29, 28 sure. for Jan, you know, but uh, yeah, folks, like I just, and I just, the lack of respect when it comes to the people who think this is a close fight versus people who want to trot out that R word. It's right. just like, gosh, folks, you know, I've been there for some robberies. This was a close fight. And I know people don't like yeah. Sean and I tell you what, a buddy of mine do the podcast with, he had three different books where he unloaded on Jan. Yeah. The guy's in full, he, he probably hasn't left his room yet. He's so depressed. Yeah. But that's what yeah. people, that's why yeah. people are so upset is because they're like, this is the steal of a century. They thought yeah. Jan should have been minus 500. People are getting very bitter. Yeah. We have two more fights we need to get yes. to. Uh, and by the way, too, in terms of like Twitter and uh, me celebrating the Yankees being eliminated, right? Like, <laughs> dude, call me a clown. Like yeah. if you do, it, just block me, just yeah. block me. That's if you don't so want to see the Yankees venom the day they choke, fucking block <laughs> me. What is it? Sweat. Ken Flo, Benil Daryush was actually in the bowels of the hotel when we got back dealing with like a scratched cornea. So hopefully he's oh, wow. okay because yeah. those things can be not ideal. But it's Benil Daryush cashing for the underdog players over Mataj Gamrot. Unanimous decision, 30-27 times two and then 29-28. Gamrot is unbelievable to watch live. I mean, the takedowns are just lightning, mixing it all together. But Daryush is the guy, Ken Flo. Eight in a row at 155 pounds. He ends essentially a year and a half long layoff as an underdog against a fighter like this. Incredible performance for Daryush finds himself really where he was going in on the short list of top lightweight contenders. Your thoughts, John, you know what I got wrong in that fight? What's that? Everything, everything, <laughs> everything I got wrong in that fight. Yep. Hey, listen, yep. I thought Daryush looked phenomenal. Um, I thought that I vastly underestimated his wrestling ability. He was countering every damn thing that he, like Gamrot is a very good wrestler, man. Again, we saw that in the Sarukian, in the Sarukian fight, which was a banger. Uh, Gamrot could not keep up the pace. He didn't know what the hell he had to do to keep Daryush on that mat. He was like a fucking bouncing ball on that canvas. It was <laughs> uh, it, from the, from the traditional counter wrestling to the funk style roles to the submission attempts on the legs to get those scrambles. It was brilliant stuff. For that first round, I don't think they stopped moving. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, they were nonstop grappling, trying to outposition each other. Neither of them allowed each of the other one to relax in any position. It was a thing of beauty. That's what grappling is all about. Daryush was on point with his game. There was no uh, stupid decision-making on his part of just deciding to brawl. His hands were up the whole damn time. Like, dude, he did his homework. Like, this was oh. a completely different Daryush. What what prevented me from going the route of Daryush was he was not reliable as far as mm-hmm. being disciplined. He was disciplined this whole time. It was, it was awesome to see. Benny is one of the sweetest guys you'll meet in the sport. Uh, it was great to see him get this win. And if this is the Daryush that is going to continue as he moves forward, um, he's going to be a very difficult man to beat, especially for someone like Mahasha, who has a wrestling heavy game. Uh, I think that's going to be really interesting. And he has a legitimate shot. Now, you know, I, I, I think that highly of his performance. Petrie, mm-hmm. not hard to see why Ken Flo has consistent television work. That analysis is sort of hard to follow. Perfect. Thoughts on, yeah. uh, on, on Daryush and Gamrot. The only fight I got wrong in the main card, and it was a big swing and a miss. I had Gamrot by decision, but man, Benny looked strong. His hips looked strong. He was countering everything. His cardio is great. And what sealed him the fight, it was it was a competitive fight. I obviously thought Benny was up, but that left hand that put Gamrot down was, was a thing of beauty. Perfect time. Everything. Gamrot rushed a lot of takedowns. It was like almost he was afraid to stand up. He kept jumping these singles, and you're you're not going to get after the second round. He should have known you're not getting Daryush down the single. He's too good. He's too strong. Uh, super impressed with Daryush. Uh, with on that, I'm glad he won. Um, he deserves to get the big shots. I know Gamrot's still fairly new to the promotion, but he's been doing it for a while. Him and Oliveira makes all the sense in the world. Throw him in an event somewhere, um, and that'd be like a tight eliminator since Islam's doing uh, the Volk fight. 
Yeah, that makes sense. But Kempflow, the question beckons of all the top lightweights now, if you had to send one of them in there to save a dog's life to beat Islam Makashev, a lot of people are sending fucking Benny Darius in there. I'm telling you. You know? I think so, too. You know, and people forget this dude has a nasty guard, too. He was very well known for his guard in the jiu-jitsu, um, in the sport of jiu-jitsu. So, um, yeah, I, I think he's got a lot of tools uh, that make him an interesting out against someone like a Mahashev. You know, he's got that high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt pedigree. Um, he, can, he can hit. He can knock you out. Um, he, and he clearly knows how to wrestle now. So that mm-hmm. is a very interesting fight. Yeah, no sure. question. All right, before we spin it forward and get to the next live event, UFC Fight Night, Cater versus Allen, there is one final fight that we would like to discuss, the featured prelim of the night, featuring Anakin and Florian podcast channel, podcast host, Bilal, remember the name, Muhammad, came in number five in the world against, I think, number eight, Sean Brady, who was undefeated at 15-0, and and Ken Flo, it is Bilal by TKO at the 447 mark of round two. A lot of layers to this one. Bilal and Brady were supposed to fight in December of 2020. That fight did not materialize. And the time at which the fight materialized, Bilal had already taken out guys in the top five, beaten them, not taken them out per se, but fighting down in the rankings against a guy who was all the rage, favored to beat him. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, Sean Brady was anointed and a huge, huge win because of all of that backdrop for Bilal Muhammad. Your thoughts on the uh, featured prelim over the weekend at UFC 280. Well, this is why numbers never tell the whole story. And, and people, you know, will fall in love with numbers and, you know, seeing that undefeated record. Don't look at that record. Look at who they've beaten it and how they've beaten them. That is is way more critical. So those those are a lot of things that numbers really can't tell the story of. And for me, Bilal, the fact that this dude, when his back is up against the wall, uh, when there's pressure on the line, when he needs to come up with a great game plan, and he's facing all these very dangerous fighters, um, you know, he's proven that. Sean Brady hasn't to me yet, despite being undefeated. Not to say he, he can't be a champion in the sport. Maybe he can, but. Right now, at where they're meeting at, at both stages of their career, Bilal, to me, wasn't only the pick. It was an easy pick to me. You know, Again, mm-hmm. give me the guy who has walked through the fire. Bilal is that dude. Um, and um, I, I think it was Brian. I think you said this on, on Twitter. Someone did. Was that he was figuring out – um, he was figuring out Brady at the end of that first round. And you could see right. he just started mm-hmm. – he kept that pressure on and, and just him being the intelligent fighter that he is uh, started to pick him pick him apart. Mm-hmm. And once he saw that egg cracking, man, he just kept uh, that pressure on and ended up taking him out. So that was experience. That was intelligence. Um, and, and that was just hard training, man. Uh, mm-hmm. Awesome performance. Couldn't be happier for Bilal. Spent five weeks in Dubai and then Abu Dhabi alongside Habib and Islam and Abubakar and Nurmagomedov and a lot to get into it as far as Bilal's performance is concerned. I thought Sean Brady did win the first round. I went back and watched it. Bilal came on strong to Kenny's point at the end of the round, but I thought Brady landed the more significant strikes. And then there was a front kick from Sean at the 343 mark of round two that came within an inch of hurting Bilal. And, (laughs) you know, I know a lot of people feel like Brady underperformed and and still, I think, sometimes even want to take away from Bilal somehow, some way. Um, But it is a game of inches. Go ahead, Ken Flo. John, I was going to say, to to your point and to it being a game of inches, what concerned me about that kick was that not only did he almost land it, but Bilal didn't see it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, no, dude, like, <laughs> stay on, stay on your game. You're, you're doing good. Yep. Just so that was nervous. But yeah, I, you know, that made me nervous. But uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's a good point. So Bilal started like five for 30 and eventually found the range later in round one. Brady had some moments even in round two. Um, but, you know, I just think there's a lot to like about what Bilal has done in terms of the methodical build and now bringing Khabib Nurmagomedov into an egoless corner, right? You're bringing Khabib Mm -hmm. into a corner that has Lewis Taylor, no fucking ego, Mike Valley, no ego, right? So when Bilal puts Khabib over in the post-fight interview and says literally like he was coaching me to finish him, whereas maybe if you're reading into Bilal's comments, maybe if there wasn't that imperative coming from the corner that he's a little bit conservative, like Khabib's like, this is your moment. Like the referee's Mm -hmm. ready to give you a standing TKO go for it right like Habib's cornering actually paid off I don't know man high fight IQ 
commitment is all in, uh, you know, and there were times as Bilal built into a top five fighter, Bri, where maybe I didn't think the ceiling was championship. I certainly do yeah. now. Yeah, I, I've always felt really high on. I, I've cashed him as a dog. He just paid for my Vegas trip. I owe him a pair of Crocs. Uh-huh. I know he's a Croc guy. Get him a dinner or something <laughs> when I'm in Vegas. Um, listen, I thought the fight was going to go like that. I thought Bilal was going to have a slow first round, but it was going to be pressure. And then Brady, who's a muscled up dude, got put on his back foot. I figured he would slow down and Bilal would take over with the wrestling. But instead of doing that, he just did it with his hands. And then he knew he had to walk through fire because Brady's a good counter puncher. He ate some shots, walked through fire because I'm not, I'm not taking a fucking step back. I'm going to break this dude. And he did. When Brady dropped his hands, he started getting a little tired. Bilal landed that right hand and then closed the show. And that's what people want to see. I, I said on last time we, we capped a Bilal fight, I said Bilal's got elite cardio, probably the best at 170. Everyone's throwing out Colby Covington. That's fine. This was elite cardio on display. Bilal barely was sweating and it was a hot arena. This dude, through a lot and put out a lot. And, and I'm, I'm so happy for him. I don't know him all that well. He's a part of the channel. I've been on his show once and uh, I couldn't be for happier. And it's not only that, but it has to be that much sweeter that he was a fucking underdog, which I thought is crazy. No yeah. disrespect to Sean Brady, but for Bilal being an underdog after his resume, I mean, my, as a bet, as a gambler now, my only regret is I didn't put my fucking house on it. That's well, when I watched I the film, I was even more surprised <laughs> when I watched the Sean yeah. Brady, Michael Chiesa third round, you know? Yeah. Felt like yeah. Blau was going to realize a lot of success on the feet. I think Sean yeah. Brady will be back. I really think this loss for is sure. going to be of high value for him. And I think maybe you'll see him, uh, you know, make some changes. And, uh, you know, I do think Paul Felder might try to get involved a little bit as far as Sean Brady's co- uh, career is concerned. And I think there's a, there's a lot of value there. Uh but the story is Bilal remember the name Muhammad. And, you know, for those that would suggest any bias, I just want to say, you know, there was a time where Bilal texted my twin brother and was like, dude, John's got a chill on this Hamza Chimaev <laughs> stuff, right? So there has been a time not all that long ago where I pissed off Bilal. So, you know, I don't want to hear from people who uh, who suggest that there was any sort of bias. I stand by the call. And uh, to Brian Petrie's point, you know, Bilal Muhammad went in there against a guy who's ranked below him 15-0. Uh, and finished him, you know? So yeah. if Bilal wants to say Philadelphia sucks, certainly has the platform on which to do He's it. Allowed to say and it. incidentally, not my favorite U.S. city either. I love the Phillies, though, and Bryce Harper, but I don't necessarily love Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> all right, we will talk to Bilal, remember the name Muhammad, later in the week. You know, we wanted Kenny to be a part of that interview, and Kenny's mm-hmm. schedule, I'm just saying, is just a little bit challenging right now. But Kenny, just so you know, like we don't want to talk to Bilal unless you're there for it. So hopefully we can find some time with you on either Wednesday or Thursday. Collect with, uh, connect with Bilal later later in the week. We don't necessarily need you for the Ray Longo minute. We're just going to light Ray up and, uh, <laughs> you know, just fucking wind up the Ray Longo doll and let him Ray fucking Longo. rip. Um, all right. Unless I've left anything out, I think we can uh, get on to our three predictions for UFC Fight Night. Cater versus Allen. We'll start with the main card fight at light heavyweight. Someone's going to be very sore and very hurt after this fight, if not both of them. I mean, it's going to be at the apex. Everything is just going to sound like bones breaking on bones. Dustin Jacoby, minus 155. Khalil Roundtree Jr., plus 135. How about Jacoby, the Hanyak, unbeaten in nine fights since returning to MMA in 2019. Eight wins and a split draw. He's won four in a row in the UFC, now faces Khalil Roundtree Jr. Bry, he's won two in a row, last of which a bonus-winning knockout of Carl Robertson earlier this year. You're going Roundtree Jr. for the favorite Dustin Jacoby. Great matchmaking here. I mean, Jacoby hasn't lost a competition since 2016. I mean, that's absolutely insane. The move to Colorado has done him so much, so well, because not only is this guy finding his cardio, which is, I think, plagued him in the past, but he's so deadly accurate, and now he's confident. He's taking fights on short notice because he's not worried about his tank. He's taking fights injured. He had a busted up leg his last time out, never threw any kicks. He's taking these fights because he's so confident in his preparation. Then you get a clear round through. This guy, I cannot get this guy right. Since the ultimate fighter, I can't get this fucking guy right. He goes out there. He's a murderer. Or I go out there and I bet a ticket and he lays an egg and I'm standing there with a ticket in my hand. Like, what the fuck just happened? This is the same guy that's throwing baseball bats for legs. Um, good fight for both guys. I really do. And I, I love the line. I think the line is probably lined here because I think Jacoby just is that much cleaner on the feet. And I think he's been in there with Alex Pereira in the kickboxing world. He's been there with really explosive guys and he lost a prayer, but he got knocked out, but he's done well against really high level guys. 
So I don't think the explosiveness of, uh, of Roundtree is going to be really that big of a difference here. I started off liking Jacoby. Now I'm starting to love him. This is going to be a must bet for me. Oh, and wow. I wouldn't be surprised if Roundtree fades a little bit. That has been he's he's been fixing it, but in the past he has faded. Maybe like a late second, early third TKO KO for Jacoby. Uh, I'm on the Jacoby champ, babe. Kenny, I do planks. I feel like if either one of these guys kicked my body, it would be fatal. Like I would die. I'm serious. I'm serious. Like I think it would shake up my core, hit, an, hit, a, hit a vital organ, and I would die. Like I, I just yeah. think this is great matchmaking. What do you think about Jacoby and, and Roundtree Jr.? They, they might even separate your legs from your torso, dude. Uh, these guys kick hard. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is a tough one for me. And, and you know, Brian, spot on uh, per usual. Uh, Roundtree is a hard guy to, to depend on. And I guess when I'm looking at this, I need some kind of consistency. And, and Jacoby is more consistent. Um, Roundtree is more dangerous, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, um, both are capable of finishing. But if you were to tell me, hey, who finishes this fight? I might lean towards Roundtree. Mm -hmm. Who wins the fight? I, I got to go with consistency, uh, Jacoby. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm with Brian there. By the way, if anybody is getting me that picture of Ken Flo beating up Joe Lozon for uh, for behind me for the podcast, I need anti glare glass because this photo photo excuse me photo Jesus man I'm underslept but the one behind me of me Rogan and DC behind us right now doesn't have that anti glare glass anti glare glass note it I got it I just marked that in my head got thanks Brad thank uh, co main event in the welterweight division Max Griffin minus one seventy five Tim Means business plus one fifty. Max Payne coming off that tough split decision loss, Bry, right? Neil yeah. Magny, Columbus, Columbus Ohio. Yeah. We were there. Uh, Means yep. was submitted by Kevin Holland back on June 18th. How did you see Griffin Magny? And ultimately, how do you see Griffin versus Timmy Means business? So, yeah, I thought Griffin won the Magny fight. I think Griffin's biggest problem is, is a little bit of cardio issues, especially in the Morono fight. He used to get hurt a lot in fights and then just could never recover. And then just he's so tough, he could hang on. But the Magny fight, I thought he fought very well against a really Awkward, tough guy to look good against Neil Magny. You, just, you don't really, unless you finish him, you don't really look good against them. But this is going to be a dirty, grimy fight. This is going to be in the clinch, elbows, just bloody. I mean, I wish I could bet. Is there going to be blood? Yes. It's probably minus 10,000, but I take <laughs> those odds. And Timmy, Timmy Dirty Bird means he's 38 years old. And if you Google, I don't give a fuck, it's a picture of Timmy Means' first shot. I guarantee yeah. it. This guy is just. I love him. I love him watching I him fight. Too. He's an exciting fighter. It's been around forever. Pretty well rounded. Lately, though, he seems like he gets shaken a little bit. Both these guys can get touched. I mean, Max Griffin's 36. He's not this young dog either. I think we've seen Max Griffin fully rounded out. I think he is his complete fighter self right now. Yeah. And I yeah. think he's going to push a pace. I think Tim Means is going to have to push a pace as well. And it's going to come down to, I think, probably a decision. I don't see either guy finish each other. I see Max maybe land a couple takedowns. Tim's pretty good off his back, but... Man, this is a really tough fight to cap. I'm not running to the window to bet this fight, but mm. for the purpose of our game, I'm going to go Griffin by decision. Just just lean him a slightly just because he's a little more athletic. It's not a game, man. It's not a fucking game, man. Don't you ever call it a game. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's a good handicap. I really like both of these guys. I think, Kenny, it's fitting given that you and I called so many of his early fights for Tim Means on Fuel TV that I'm wearing the Fuel TV t-shirt today. Yeah. I love it. Tim Means, I Fuel TV it. staple. How do you see his chances here, Ken Flo, against uh, the favored Max Payne Griffin? Yeah, and to your point, it, it's amazing that Tim Means has been fighting for that long. Um, but I, I do think that, um, you know, time is our biggest opponent. And, and I think Tim is starting to come to terms with that a little bit. Um, he He's still nasty. He still wants to try to knock you out, but I don't know if he has that same, brings that same kind of spunk, that same kind of energy that he had when we started calling his fights back in the day, John. Um, but man, he's got a set of skills that makes him dangerous against anyone. I just think Max Griffin's going to be a little bit fresher, a little bit faster. Uh, and that might be the difference between him getting the nod or not at the end of those 15 minutes. And, and yeah, BP, I agree. I think it's going to go to decision. Um, mm -hmm. You know, perhaps there's a finish there. But I think Max just a little fresher, a little crisper with some of the things he's doing right now. Um, but, man, I, I think it's going to be an exciting fight. Yeah. All right, next up, main event at featherweight. Fourth-ranked Calvin Cater, minus 110. Fifth-ranked. Arnold Almighty Allen, also minus 110 right now here on a Monday on DraftKings Sportsbook. 
Love the fight, guys. Mm -hmm. 9-0 for Arnold Allen in the UFC. Last two wins of a high quality, Sadiq Youssef and Dan Hooker. Cater, you guys remember, lost that split to Josh Emmett, but now with a chance to take Allen's UFCO. So a huge spot here for Cater. Arnold Allen, 18-1 and overall. Bry, never been finished. Your thoughts on him here against Cater Mania? Banger of a featherweight fight here. I mean, listen, if Allen wins, I think he gets the shot. If he will, if he's willing to wake, because we know Volk might be going up. But man, you know, this is a really tough fight. I mean, you look at the records, man. That's what you got to do. You look at the records, and Cater has fought the better competition. Win, lose, or draw, he's fought the better competition. He's been in there with Max Holloway. He's been in there with Josh Emmett, which a fight where very, very close. I think I scored it for Cater, but you know, it, it was very close. You look at Allen, who's just inconsistent. He fights once, twice a year. Out of his nine UFC fights, he only has three finishes. And a lot of those earlier fights were guys I think he should have been finishing. And he's a 28-year-old guy, so he's still young, still had time to grow. He looks good against Dan Hooker, finished Dan Hooker, but he also got clipped in that fight. He also got put down in that fight. And Dan Hooker at 145 had no business being at 145. I know he's trying some new things for his career, but not taking anything away from Allen, I just don't think he's a killer. I think he he does best when he mixes everything up. I think his stand up is good. I don't think it's as good as Cater's. I think Cater's boxing is good. I think his wrestling is good, and and I think Cater's athletic and can work to get off his back if that goes there. Allen mixes things up well. I think Cater's a more dangerous guy, and I think Cater struggles with guys that are killers. He took a Josh Emmett punch clean. He can take an Allen Allen punch. He got outboxed by Max Holloway. Didn't give up even though it was a bloodbath. So with that being said. I'm all over Cater on this. Out of pick them out. I love pick them fights. Minus 110. I thought Cater would be a slight favorite here. I know Allen's 9-0, 18 and 1, great record, young guy coming off a good win. And Allen's or Cater's coming off a loss. But man, I just you look at records, you look at skills. I like Cater here. I could be underestimating Arnold Allen, but give me Calvin Cater, probably by decision. Um, but yeah, give me Calvin Cater. Ken Flo, I just really am fascinated to see this fight. Might even watch it on ESPN Plus. What do you have for us on the main event? Yeah, you know, similar to the Sean Brady and Bilal uh, fight, um, I, I, again, Cater is a guy that um, has been through the fire. He, he's been proven. I think Arnold Allen has toughness as well. Don't get me wrong. But uh, as Brian said, he hasn't faced the same kind of caliber of competition uh, that Cater has. Um, that's significant because not only do we know that Cater is tough, but we also – you have to assume that he's learning from those experiences. Um, I also thought he won that last fight against Josh Emmett. Um, so when you're accruing that level of experience, that really matters, um, especially in a lot of these like, five-round fights. You get in there with Max Holloway, you don't think you're going to learn from that fight. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, Arnold Allen can mix things up with his takedowns and things, and I don't think Cater's going to be a threat on his back. Is he going to be able to do that consistently, in my opinion? From what I've seen, I'm not so sure. Um, but that's his best bet, is, is trying to mix in his grappling, takedowns, landing some ground and pound, and, and scoring enough uh, on the ground with his ground and pound uh, to win that fight. Um, but I just don't see it happening on a consistent basis. I like Calvin Cater here as well. All right, both of our guys like Calvin Cater in the main event coming up this Saturday. Brian, before we let you go, um, do you yes. use antiperspirant, deodorant? What do you use under your arms, if I could ask? <laughs> so I use deodorant, but here's, here's and this is the honest to God truth. I've never had BO in my life. I don't have armpit hair. And being a bigger guy, I don't sweat a whole lot. I know okay. we had a weigh-in incident or a, a press conference incident with you, John, that a lot of people are going around with. Is that where we're leaning towards? Kenny, do you wear uh antiperspirant deodorant? What do you what do you what do you what do you do under the arms, Kenny? I go the deodorant route. I'm not a big sweater. Like okay. it takes no. me a lot to really get sweaty. Yeah. So sweaty. my feet don't sweat, my hands don't sweat, right? Arm sweat glands in my armpits just don't care. <laughs> That I'm on Hell, television whatsoever. There. Okay. Yeah, All right. So, there. and, but you know, my yeah. twin brother has had this issue as well. Right. And I did not expect to have to host the press conference. Right. Dana sure. came in a little bit late from Abu Dhabi. So I only had one button down and it happened to be essentially white. And yeah, like my armpit. So I actually recently have gone from degree antiperspirant and deodorant. Then I went to this native stuff that was, um, okay. you know, way too natural yeah. for uh, a sure. recreational yeah. guy like me. And then yeah. I went to Old Spice and I will never put Old Spice under my armpits ever no, again. But no if anybody, Old Spice. 
if anybody no has any question. deodorant recommendations, feel free. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, do you see? I, I mean, <laughs> it's, <bad. laughs> it's like it's like ah, it's so like quadruple good. pit stain. It's like pit stains My on buddy, pit stains on pit stains on pit stains. My buddy texted me. He's like, "Is it hot there?" I was like, "Well, yeah, dude. They're in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, he's of in the desert. Like, he's in the he's desert." Like, he's like, "Do you think John?" He was like worried about. It. Do you think John's okay? I was like, "I don't even know what you're, I, I haven't seen it yet." And I was like, "I don't even know what you're talking about." Yeah, I mean, I it's, <laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't even have to exercise on show day. I had lost so much oh, water. Man. I could fit into that suit with uh, John. There's, <laughs> hey, dude, there's a sponsor in your future. I'm telling you right now. You you oh, can make yeah. you can make a lot of money. Nate, not only if there's any sponsors out there. Not only could you help my my boy John out with a great deal, but mm-hmm. you could also make your company look really good. Like here's John before using right, X product. Right here's right. John after using this X product. Everybody wins. Think about it. Speed Think about stick it. brute. I feel like you would fit a brute scent <laughs> like that. Right. That's, that's Thanks, John bro. Anik. Thanks, bro. Hey, <laughs> uh, <laughs> ha- hey, hey. Have a great yeah. rest of the day. Uh, better hey, evening, buddy. We'll talk to you uh, next you. week. I'll right. see, you. see you, dude. At Brian Petrie MMA on social media. Yeah, a little bit of an armpit disaster over the weekend, but uh, I have no choice <laughs> so but to uh, to move past it. You know, it is what it is, right? <laughs> All right. One final thing to do is we call on our executive producer, Cody Merrow, for the Merrow Seconds. Don't forget content coming up on this very channel later this week. A Ray Longo Minute, an interview with Bilal Muhammad, and then remember the show, of course, with Bilal and my identical twin, Jason Anik. But now uh, we go to the cutting room floor stuff. And anything we may have missed. Hi, Cody. What'd you think of UFC 280, my man? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. A little day card, you know, get in and out early. You know, usually I'm slubbing around, waiting for those fights on in five o'clock Eastern time. So got got them out the bag and right, uh, got to use the night, got to utilize the night. You know what I mean? This oh, Merrill I- Seconds is uh, brought to you by Right Guard Sport. Whether you're in yeah, half yeah. guard, full <laughs> guard, or no guard, Right guard has you covered. Uh, right guard sport. Use code John Anik yeah. for fifteen percent off today. Rest assured, we went black T-shirt the next day for the weigh-in, though. Yeah, well, and, we're definitely uh, not getting an Old Spice sponsor. So <laughs> Dana told me to just wear black up there. I I had to show him that picture. I had to pull out my phone. I was like, boss, you know. He actually he was like, thanks for filling in yesterday. I was like, dude, you see this man? You fucking see this? You know? <laughs> the laughing stock of the internet. I get off the the podium i go back to my room i open my phone i have like 300 mentions i'm like oh what did i say and it's like oh no it's just 300 mentions a bit about your armpits everything's fine much rather that than have said something like you know and yeah, inflammatory something about testicles yeah. or you know something actually one thing i got criticized for saying was i was asked about the fight between charles and islam and i said i'm sitting here with two of the greatest lightweights of all time and i was roundly criticized for that do you know how many people have double-digit winning streaks in UFC lightweight history? Tony Ferguson, Khabib Nurmagomedov, Islam Makhachev, and Charles. What, like, what, what am I? I don't know. What am I missing? I mean, strength of schedule for Islam probably going to get a lot better now that he's the champ. Sorry, Cody. What do you got? No, my favorite part about that was the fact that I knew that you were caught off guard by that. You were just kind of standing that you're like the press conference isn't for John Anik, and then they're like, "Oh, I got a question for John," and John's like. What the fuck am I going to say? Well, no, I'm always ready. I'm always ready. Well, I'm just, not, not uh, to say you're not ready. I'm also but. always opinionated. And so sometimes, you know, I uh, say things and I get a little bit too superlative in nature. But. <laughs> yeah. Um. So just to circle back to, so you talked earlier about um that I had suggested Aljo call out Volk in the post fight. Now that right. wasn't because I thought 135 was cleared out. That was more opportunistic, you know, because Volk is there sitting there in the front row saying, oh, I'm going to go up, you know, that. That's why I thought, and then Aljo has talked about going up before the weight cut, as you said, and then the Marab situation. So there's a lot there. And sort of Cody was saying, like, instead of Kenny saying, like, Henry Sadudu, just say, hey, Volk, you're moving up to 55. You can't even beat the Bantamweight champ, you know, and then you can even right. move on to Cheeto and everybody else. But really being focused on maximizing the moment, uh, I thought largely did a good job with the names he called out. I just thought it was a little bit wayward the way he did it, you know. Yeah, no, I yeah. thought it was great stuff. Some final things here from uh, UFC 280. Performance of the night, Bilal Muhammad and Islam Mahachev. Fight of the night, Jan versus O'Malley. Uh, interesting that Habib actually retired two years ago today as we're recording the episode. Wow. So, wow. S- seemingly seems like just yesterday, you know, but yeah, two years ago was that uh, retirement speech in our best viewed episode of all time. Uh, sure dogs, Tristan Critchfield had a couple of by the numbers here that I thought were interesting. So, uh, Aljamain Sterling, you know, you always talk about Dominic Cruz consensus band of win of all time. I think you're going to start talking about Aljamain Sterling in that conversation. He moves to eight consecutive victories, the longest UFC streak in history at Bantamweight. And then Ever, his career, yes. 
his career 13 wins uh, in the UFC at Bantamweight also ties the record for uh, wins with TJ Dillashaw. So uh, sneaky. I feel like he sneakily crept up there. Yeah, the 13 Bantamweight UFC time. Bantamweight wins. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, seems like it's just yesterday, you know, Ray was talking on the podcast. Like, oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about this yeah. kid in the gym. Yeah. Yep. Coming to fruition. Gets his, gets his stuff together. Yeah. And I've, I don't know if I've ever told this story, but Kenny, you remember when you were in that sauna? <laughs> you were dying. <laughs> I'm surprised you're still here, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. I don't know if I brought it up before. Uh, oh, I love Ray. <laughs> moving down the line, uh, 26 of 26 submitted scorecards had Jan over O'Malley on MMA decisions, but the three All that All 26. Correct. 26 wow. of 26 of the mid- media scorecards. But of the three that matter, two had two rounds for O'Malley. So as the cookie crumbles, um, of the 3,000 unofficial cards, 21% had O'Malley winning. Here's the, here's the problem with that stuff, right? It's like uh, – and I love the verdict guys and all that stuff. But like sometimes they'll, they'll put out what the, public, what the public thinks about a certain thing. It's like what if we had a, uh, 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 you know, some kind of poll of what people thought about like quantum physics where no one knows what the fuck quantum physics is or what's going on. And we took a poll of what is transpiring between two fucking molecules, wherever the hell, and everyone just got it wrong. It doesn't mean just because the public views it a certain way that, you know, they're going to be more educated, that their uh, opinion matters more over three fucking professionals in the arena. Yeah, no, it's a good yeah. point. And we're, we're big verdict MMA supporters here in terms of the platform and everything that they've done. But yeah. Ben Cartledge is a credentialed judge. And we are going to touch base with Sean Sheehan in the not too distant future and uh, get his thoughts on everything that's going on as far as that stuff is concerned. I am curious how Sean Sheehan scored that yeah. on Sean O'Malley fight as well. Um, you know, 29 28 Yan was Sean, o, Sean okay. Sheehan's scorecard. Yeah. Makes sense. I'm, I'm prepared. I got my numbers here. Look at you. Look that at makes you. sense. I wouldn't well, have a problem with that. And I also think that Kenny's point, you know, like um, the parallel to be drawn is in politics, like the type of person that responds to a survey is usually the same type of person. So 26 people group think go and submit that Jan won, you know, feasible to believe the type of person that's going to MMA decisions dot com all scored that fight that way. Whereas 21 yeah. percent of the public also had O'Malley winning. I didn't yeah. think it was a robbery. I thought it was close, but I did have Jan winning myself. Uh, Benny Dariush, you know, not to be overlooked, Nash's eighth consecutive victory at 155, the second longest active win streak in the division. Uh, he historically put himself in great company. His 16th career UFC lightweight win is behind only Cerrone, who we know is retired, and Jim Miller, who has 21, that's, who's still going. That's impressive, man. Yeah. Damn. Longevity. I think it's under wow. understated how that 155 division can kind of have these long consecutive title, you know, uh, victory runs and then not get title shots. It's kind of crazy. By the way, Andre Arlovsky, 39th UFC appearance coming up this Saturday night. He had like a six year UFC gap. This guy would be well over 50 had he stayed. But it's good crazy. on Andre Arlovsky, I think, who will retire as the uh, the all time appearance king of the UFC. Crazy, crazy stuff. Imagine that, that many just fights in an octagon. I mean, some people don't get that many NFL games in a career. Yeah, MLB yeah. starts, you know, you're fighting in a cage. It's insane. That's nuts. And a heavyweight too, you know, like it's not exactly the, you know, the poster child right. of CTE, you know? Right, it's heavy, heavyweight. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, last point on UFC 280, Bilal moves the nine straight wins, second only to Leon Edwards. Uh, it was the first UFC bout where Brady did not land a takedown. So, uh, Motown, yeah. Philly. Again. <laughs> playing a team. little east coast swing um and then john last thing for you is uh on a recent episode of the joe rogan experience uh red hot chili peppers lead singer anthony kiedis and joe you know spoke very glowingly on you a couple of the quotes uh joe said that you are a fucking master and he said that you were the best play-by-play guy in the history of the sport so just wanted to get your thoughts on that you know my boss craig borsari thank you cody Cody Merrill, one of my biggest supporters. Um, my boss, Craig, pulled me aside and was like, hey, if you're feeling bad about the armpits, um, you should really listen to what Joe and Anthony Kiedis had to say about you. But no, I mean, the support from Joe obviously means the world to me. And um, I hold him very dear. And obviously, we all acknowledge everything that he has done. This has nothing to do with color commentators and all the analysts to my right. But praise like that from him obviously means the world. And uh, just trying to earn it every show. But um yeah, I uh, obviously that's, you know, you want to be respected by your peers and you want to try to elevate the whole booth. And I think that, um, you know, I always say that when he's there, there's a different dynamic and the booth feels elevated. And when he's not there, 
like he wasn't in Abu Dhabi, it's you you feel that absence. So, and and, and then the one that really stands out to me is um, Cody Merrill comparing you to McDonald's. That was uh, huh. that was a big one. Yeah, uh, big compliment, Cody. Yeah. What are you and comparing like, my fucking guy to like, McDonald's? Yeah, well, no, because you, no, no matter where he is, no matter me, what give time me, give zone, me the high level he's consistent. House, dog, four or five stars. Don't get McDonald's. Yeah, I got to set my Wolf eldest daughter. Me. My eldest daughter is so anti McDonald's, right? That it like has ruined McDonald's for me, right? But I got to tell you, when I came back from Abu Dhabi, I didn't go to McDonald's, but seeing those golden arches when I came home, just outstanding. Just felt right at home. I have to say, go ahead, Cody. No, no, mine's going to wrap it up. So go ahead. That the highlight for me, Kenny in Abu Dhabi was I got to see Leon Edwards and congratulate him right before the ceremonial way. And, you know, for the first time and he held me tight and he said in my ear, he's like, He's not cut from that cloth, you know, so um, that really means a lot to me, right? That uh, I got totally lucky with that for the record. Like, I don't, I think sometimes, as I've said, you know, need breaks in a broadcasting career, better to be lucky than good. That was just lucky timing by me more than anything else. But obviously every time he watches that highlight, he hears that. And, um, you know, we're just trying to do right by these athletes, fight one through fucking 15. Like, that's really all it is, you know? The gut knows better than the brain. Yeah, there you go. And you I got a big fucking gut too. <laughs> All right, Cody, what's your final note, my man? Oh, well, you know what it is. It's the most coveted aspect of the podcast is Cody's covers. Oh, yeah. All right. So, so tell us. So, 0 and 5 on the season. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> crushing it. Just crushing it. Um, and because we're on a Monday, you know, I got to go with the Monday night game. And, you know, the Bears, Chicago, Bilal Muhammad coming into New England, New England minus eight. That's the play. So I hate to put the the wax jinx on uh, the Patriots, but that's what it's going to be. Favorites 4-0 and and against the spread in the last four meetings. The Bears are 0-4. Obviously, a lot of those were with Tom Brady. Max coming back, lean on the run. The Bears are 31st in rush defense. So minus eight is the pick to fade for Cody Merrill. All right, Cody. Thank you very much. We'll see if Cody can get on the board. Um, one final thing that I did want to say. Um, our late makeup artist, Susie Freeton. Her birthday is this Wednesday, October 26th. And I wanted to say that um, thanks to our folks at millions.co, they do the one more sleep merchandise. Uh, they are going to match my $10,000 donation and we together are going to make a $20,000 donation to a cancer charity in honor of Susie Freeton. So I wanted to wow. throw this out to the Anakin Florian podcast audience. If there's a, a children's cancer charity or a cancer charity that you are passionate about, we're only going to be choosing one of these, but feel free to let us know at Anik Florian pod at John underscore Anik, either on Instagram or on Twitter. Um, and later this month or early November, we're going to make a $20,000 donation on behalf of Susie Freeton to a cancer charity uh, on behalf of myself and, uh, and millions.co uh, in honor of my, my dear friend's birthday here, October 26th. Um, also of note, Kenny Florian, martial arts.com. I encourage you to check that out. You know, one, thing I really wanted to talk about with you and Bilal later this week is just knowing some of the grappling challenges that inevitably await Bilal with Hamzat Chimaev and Colby Covington, right? I mean, Bilal has worked so dutifully on all these parts of his game and now he'll have Khabib and Islam. But I do think like having some fucking leg lock that you can go to that you practice 10,000 times. I know have some fucking front shock with front choke with a weird grip, like Sadiq use like have some fucking choke that you can go. I don't know. I was just talking to Cody this morning about Ryan Hall, Ken Flo got like, I don't know. I want to get into some of that with Bilal later in the week because I cool. think it would be of tremendous value um, for him to find Kenny Florian's house wherever it is in the greater United States and go into that padded room <laughs> with him and his daughter. Today's episode of the Anakin Florian Podcast brought to you in part by UFC Fight Pass, the world's premier combat sports streaming service with over 200 live events, the largest fight library in existence, original shows, and so much more. Sign up for one year and get half off for a limited time, ufcfightpass.com slash sign up. Also, you can get your Anik Florian podcast merch on our website, anikflorianpodcast.com. Millions.co for the one more sleep. Our New York City limited edition UFC 281 one more sleep t-shirts uh, will be out later this week. Uh, with that, thank you to Brian Petrie. Thanks to Cody Merrow. Thanks to all of you uh, for listening, for watching, for telling your friends. Don't forget, later in the week, Ray Longo will be here, as will Bilal Muhammad. Until then, for Ken Flom, John Anik, we'll talk to you in less than seven days. Until then, yo later.